Good, good morning, dear parliamentarians, deputy minister, representatives of NGOs, academic institutions, and viewers. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this webinar on gender and migration. I'd like to congratulate and thank the rapporteur uh, for the Committee on Migration, Refugees and Displaced Persons, Mrs. Petra Steenan, uh, chairperson of the Dutch delegation, for taking this initiative. And I also thank Mrs. Uh, Sena Nurcelik, rapporteur for opinion uh, for the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination, for her readiness to guide us today through the first part of the proceedings. This is a great example of cooperation between our assembly committees with the added value of the participation of the parliamentary network Women Free From Violence. I see you have a very full program with many interesting speakers. I I'm afraid I won't be able to stay with you throughout the meeting because at the same time there is a meeting of the legal affairs and human rights today. Uh, but uh, I will be following your webinar as it is live streamed, even if I won't be physically here. Uh, I'm also very happy that its content will be recorded and won't be lost. Actually, we're beginning to have a quite rich library of videos, of uh, uh, relevant uh, material, something positive at least out of uh, the current restrictions throughout the pandemic. The theme of today's event uh, combines two of the big issues, if I may call them this way, on uh, both national and international agendas the need for gender equality, in this case uh, through what is called gender mainstreaming, to ensure everyone's equal access uh, to human rights. Then there is the huge question conforming us all, uh, member states, observer states and partners for democracy, of how to best take care of the hundreds and thousands of migrants who are still arriving on our shores and at our borders. Being myself uh, of Greek origin, uh, having my roots in Minor Asia, in Sinope, I'm particularly pleased to see today uh, many speakers from both Greece and Turkey. And I think uh, their presence today uh, shows the importance of two things. The first is that we must keep our attention focused on those countries, but not only. Uh, Greece and Turkey, which are taking a disproportionate share of the responsibility for hosting migrants. Half Italian in my heart, I think we shouldn't forget Italy, but Spain either. Since the early years of the increase in migration, the Assembly has been calling for better responsibility sharing, greater solidarity, but despite that, uh, the imbalance remains, and we should always uh, be aware of this. More importantly for this report, I believe Greece and Turkey's involvement has uh, also shown that we should and must learn from the experience and acquired knowledge of these countries to put in place systems that work. Yes, problems persist, but there are also solutions and they can be used. In that perspective, I'm also glad to see that you have decided to look at the question of gender and migration from two different angles. Firstly, an exploration of the gender-specific vulnerabilities, risks and needs emerging from experience in reception, asylum processing and integration of migrants. And secondly, looking at the migration policies which are the most suitable to respond to those needs. Migrants are as different as we all are. And the migration journey has different consequences for migrant women and men, for migrant girls and boys, people from different backgrounds and traditions and minorities. It seems therefore obvious that uh, policies and practices should take those differences into account. Women must most importantly be part of decision making. Migration policies must be forged for migrants and with migrants who should be equally represented. Associating greater number of women in the development of migration-related legislation would considerably change approaches, would lead to a better understanding of the needs of migrants and thus the better integration of both women and men migrants in their host countries.
Beyond the Assembly, the protection of the rights of migrants, refugees and asylum-seeking women and girls is a strategic objective of the, the Council of Europe, our organization as a whole. This is set out in the Council of Europe Gender Equality Strategy 2018-2023. As an example of that work, I'm pleased to see that you have with you today our colleague, Cecile Greboval, who will explain the progress with the new Committee of Ministers' recommendation on migrant women. Gender equality has always been one of my main priorities throughout the 28 years serving the Assembly and has become even more important to me since I took on my new responsibilities as uh, the first woman Secretary General of this Assembly in the spring. It is my strong conviction that only by achieving gender equality we can make this world a much better place for both women and men, girls and boys. I know your discussions will be constructive and practical and will feed uh, perfectly into Mrs. Tinney's report and Mrs. Celik's opinion. I hope technology will be with you. We'll do our best for that. I wish you uh, the best results of this work, and I look forward to being part in your committee meetings when you will adopt in the report and the opinion, and of course for the plenary debate. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and a nice work. Good morning to everyone who is following our webinar. I would like to begin with a big thank you to the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly for her opening words, which are very inspiring for all of us. Secondly, thank you to the reporter Petra Stinen for the initiative of organizing this webinar, which I'm certain will provide valuable input for both her report and my opinion on the subject. And last but not the least, Thanks to all our speakers today, especially to those who will take part in the first session, which I will have the honor to moderate. I'm also pleased that the webinar is also supported by the Parliamentary Network Women Free From Violence. The need for specific measures to be integrated into migration policies and practices which differentiate between women and men migrants at all levels of reception to integration is a very important subject for the Assembly to consider. In this session of the webinar, we will focus on identifying gender-specific vulnerabilities, challenges and discrimination on the ground. Women and girls are particularly vulnerable to gender violence, including trafficking, at all stages of the migration process. Many women have been and are subjected to severe forms of violence in accommodation, reception and detention facilities throughout Europe. Gender sensitive measures to protect migrant women in these facilities are absent, including gender sensitive law enforcement measures, programs to help identify victims of violence and trafficking, and access to psychological, sexual, and reproductive health care. There is also a lack of sanitary facilities, sex segregated spaces, and safe spaces for women and girls. During asylum procedures, the lack of separate interviews with access to child care and female trained staff can lead women to not talk about their trauma because of cultural norms, language barriers, or lack of information about their rights. There is unequal access for migrant women and girls to health, housing, education, language courses, labor market, and decision-making in European countries, preventing their social and economic integration. Despite an increasingly large number of highly qualified migrant, migrant women arriving in Europe, they constitute the largest overqualified and underemployed group in Europe, mostly working in the informal economy, such as domestic care, where human rights abuses are commonplace. Migrant women also often face double discrimination. They are sometimes restricted within their own communities by cultural codes and within the host countries by different stereotypes, social exclusion, and institutional and legal barriers. Depending on their background, there usually is an additional layer of discrimination on the basis of race, religion, or class. The risks are particularly high for unaccompanied girls, pregnant women, and those with small children, the international organizations having expressed serious concern about the disappearance of large number of girls in trafficking in Europe. Despite these risks, 
migration governance policies are gender blind in several European countries and where gender sensitive policies, ex policies exist, they are insufficient in addressing the risks faced by women migrating to and within Europe. The specific needs and challenges of migrant women and girls can only be addressed through gender sensitive migration and asylum policies. In addition to focusing on gender specific vulnerabilities and discriminations on the ground, speakers in this session may raise any recommendations on gender mainstreaming of migration policies in Europe for protecting and empowering migrant women. Before introducing our speakers in the first session, I would just like to give you some practical indications for our webinar. Our event is broadcast on the Facebook page of the network. It's also live streamed and will be recorded and put on YouTube. You can all see that the speakers, you can see the speakers on your screens and they will be given the floor in, in the order of the program. We also have experts who will contribute to the discussion and who will be given the floor after our keynote speakers to develop some points in a little more detail. The members of our committee and the network are connected to what is called attendee status, which means that you can write comments and questions in the event chat which will be taken up and read out in the webinar for our experts to reply. If you're an attendee and would like to take the floor, please make a request in the chat and the secretariat can give you the floor briefly. So now to our presentations. First of all, it's a great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Hayriye Nurdan Erpulay Altuntash, who is the Acting Director for Immigration and Consular Affairs at the, Migration, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. Ambassador Altuntash, you have the floor. <laughs> well, Madam Secretary General, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, Distinguished Parties, at the outset, I would like to thank Committee on Migration, Refugees and Displaced Persons and Committee on Quality and Non-Discrimination for organizing this discussion. In the last decades around the world, more people are on the move. Many of them are seeking new opportunities and a better life for themselves and their families. Others are forced to move due to disaster or conflict. Therefore, our meeting today is a telltale sign of our commitments promote the dialogue and cooperation on migration and refugee issues to the interests of international Distinguished guests, gender is central to any discussion of the causes and consequences of migration, be it forced, voluntary, or somewhere in between. It plays a significant role in migration, including a person's access to rights, roles, and responsibilities, their opportunities and experiences. The influence of gender can be seen in the reasons why people move, the places and situations to which they migrate, the protection and support received, and the way they are perceived and treated. Unfortunately, despite their valuable contributions, migrants face pervasive, intersecting forms of discrimination that impact their well-being and safety at all stages of their journey. Gender also influences these vulnerabilities and the risks of exposure to different forms of violence, exploitation and abuse, including gender-based violence and human trafficking. On the other hand, outcomes of migration can also be gendered in positive terms. Migration provides opportunities for independence, safety and growth as an enabler for development. However, when migration is not looked at through a gender lens, uh, policy responses will fail to address the specific needs. This results in the perpetuation of negative experiences and lack of available support and services. Against this backdrop, the inclusion of gender and migration and sustainable development goals recognizes the link between gender, migration and sustainable development. The global Compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration also enshrines a gender responsive approach as a cross cutting and guiding principle with the intention of ensuring that the human rights of all migrants are respected at all stages of migration, their specific needs are properly understood and addressed, and they are empowered as agents of change. Besides, in the Global Compact for Refugees, it's explicitly stated that women and girls may experience particular gender-related barriers that call for an adaptation of responses in the context of large refugee situations. Distinguished colleagues, 
As we know, women and girls make up around 50% of any refugee internally displaced or status population. Among them who are unaccompanied, pregnant, heads of households, disabled or elderly are especially one group. In this respect, allow me to briefly dwell on our efforts and share our experience in response to the humanitarian crisis, particularly the Syrian crisis, including our support to prevent any vulnerability stemming from crisis. According to the estimates, number of displaced women and girls due to the humanitarian catastrophe Indeed, Turkish society is an amalgamation of individuals from various backgrounds who have found their home in this land throughout centuries. Today, Turkey is hosting the largest refugee population in the world. Since the first flames of this crisis, we have been following a human-centered, rights and gender-based approach towards being seeking protection. So far, we have exerted every effort and mobilized all our resources in order to provide them opportunities for pursuing a dignified life. Unfortunately, the heavy burden created by this long-lasting humanitarian crisis has been left to the shoulders of a few Syrian countries. Turkey hosts 3.7 million Syrians in its territory and around 1.7 million of them are women and more than 800,000 are under 18 years old. Turkish Directorate General for Migration Management has established protection that to determine the vulnerable situation of Syrians. Upon interviews, vulnerable uh, foreign national women who are at risk are prioritized and referred to relevant authorities, namely social assistance and solidarity foundations, bar associations or Turkish Red Cross, which provide protection and necessary services for them. Ministry of Family and Social Services also offers tremendous support to the vulnerable women, students being at the forefront. In this context, psychosocial support and counseling, awareness raising campaigns, workshops and meetings are being organized in order to prevent early marriage, violence against women and sexual exploitation. To strengthen the livelihoods of the Syrian community in our country and to increase the involvement of Syrian women in the social and economic life, as well as to help the Syrian children to be prepared for the future challenges, we attach great importance to education of especially Syrian girls and women who are backbones of the future of their country. In this regard, 770,000 Syrian children in Turkey are attending schools. I'm very pleased to underline that among them, percentage of girls is 49%. In numbers, it corresponds to 380,000 Syrian girls attending primary school in Turkey. At other levels also, uh, we also have 51 Syrian female academics working in Turkey, for example, and 13,000 university students. Distinguished participants, Syrian women who enjoy temporary protection in Turkey benefit from the same services that are provided to Turkish citizens in a non-discriminatory and inclusive manner. Within this HAT2, which is HAT2 project, 741 Syrian women were employed in our own health institutions. Within the Healthcare at Home project, 246 Syrian women were recruited to provide health care at home. Under Women's Health Counseling Centers project, awareness raising training sessions were held on women's health, secure motherhood, children's health and adolescent health, as well as gender-based violence. 495,000 migrant women and girls, of which majority of Syrian, have attended these sessions. From preventing violence and abusive perspective, all women in Turkey, including Syrian women and children, who are suffering from abuse or violence, have access to violence prevention and monitoring centers throughout the country. In 2020, 3,059 Syrian women and 432 Syrian children benefited from the services of these centers. Similarly, all women, including their children who are suffering from abuse or violence, can seek shelter in the guest houses of the Ministry of Family and Social Services, Director General for Migration Management, municipalities and NGOs, which provide several services like accommodation, psychosocial, legal, medical, economic, vocational or educational support, nursery services for the kids, or guidance and counseling services. 
In 2020, 755 Syrian women, 709 Syrian children accommodated in these guest houses. Moreover, Ministry of Family and Social Services has circulated information leaflets and brochures in Turkish, Arabic, and English. Syrian women are also included in our social cohesion activities. For example, Director General for Migration Management has been holding local meetings for women since 2019 in cooperation with UNICEF. Although all these numbers are striking, they are not enough to reveal the real size of the burden we are shouldering. The fact that Syrian babies that have been born in Turkey have reached 700,000 is just a glimpse of the current picture to comprehend the real dynamic. Esteemed colleagues, according to UN Women, the impacts and implications of the COVID-19 pandemic are different for men and women and may create greater inequalities for people uh, who are in vulnerable positions such as migrants and refugees. Indeed, COVID-19 does not discriminate who it affects and the health, legal and psychosocial response to the virus should not either. In our response efforts to this pandemic, we must leave no one behind and with an inclusive manner ensure access to safe facilities without discrimination. Women migrant workers also face a high risk of losing their livelihood as well as reduce their remittance. Therefore, addressing the socio-economic impact of COVID-19 on women and girls has utmost importance. On the other hand, the current health crisis puts an additional strain on countries' finances, further stretching the humanitarian system and exacerbate displaced communities' difficulty accessing basic needs and staying safe. This pandemic has an outside impact on women and girls and augments existing vulnerabilities. It's imperative that we provide access to health services for refugees, as we have been doing nearly a decade for Syrians in our country. Unfortunately, in times of turmoil and uncertainty, such as the current pandemic, we observe the migrants and refugees become scapegoats. We see rising trends of discrimination, xenophobia, and racism all over the world. Uh, we all need to push for a more inclusive, forward-looking and positive understanding of migration and refugees. Distinguished colleagues, Turkey during the last decade has shown an extraordinary solidarity in hosting millions of asylum seekers and refugees and accommodating all their needs, whereas the responsibility sharing by the international community has been, unfortunately, very far from meeting expectations. Migration is the human story and an integral aspect of our lives. It is the responsibility of each and every individual, as well as countries, to extend a helping hand to the people in need. We should work together to protect lives and the dignity of migrants and refugees. We should continue to further our efforts in addressing migration and refugee-related issues by strengthening our cooperation both regionally and globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Altintash. I remember when in 2014, 180,000 migrants passed from Kobane to Turkey in three days. And despite the influx, the authorities established gender sensitive reception facilities with female officers, doctors, and interviewers at the border. Turkey's experience as a frontline country hosting largest number of refugees worldwide is important when examining policies um, and practice in reception and processing. I myself have worked with refugees on the ground in frontline countries, including Turkey, during the refugee crisis as the vice chair of the ADHO Committee of Migration at the OSCEPA. And in the opinion I will prepare, uh, I will draw on the experience of my own country to make sure that the recommendations made are those needed on the ground. Now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Malin Bijorik, who is a member of the European Parliament and who has been very active in the Parliament and in her country on migration issues and the need for equal treatment. You have the floor. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, can you hear me and see me? Because I don't see myself, but... Uh, we can hear you, but uh, we cannot see you. It's very strange, yeah. Okay. But, uh, uh, is distinguished colleagues, then I suggest that uh, I have to reconnect and maybe we can go for the, for the other panel speaker and I will come after that and hopefully my connection will be better.
Okay. Okay, thank Thanks. you, Ms. Bajurik. Um, our um, next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Rubisha uh, Ranchev from the Symbiosis School of Political Studies in Thessaloniki, Greece. Mr. Mr. Ranchev is also uh, the country director for the German Samaritans Humanitarian NGO and has experience with refugees and migrants in different parts of Europe. So his experience on the ground will be most interesting and use useful. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, of of the of the ground work uh, in in this context, uh, we know that most women and girls report having been sexually abused during the journey to Europe and exploited in exchange for financial support, documentation, or transport. The degradation of socioeconomic conditions and the lack of means and livelihood opportunities in a protracted displacement situation contribute to increases in gender-based violence, sexual exploitation and forced marriage. In fact, experiences of discrimination and violence and, uh, are important push factors, particularly for groups suffering from stigma and uh, marginalization in their countries of origin such as single mothers or LGBTQI persons. Upon arrival and reception in the host country, many cases never get reported due to fears of uh, stigma or retaliation, limited av availability of or access to services and lack of awareness about the benefits of seeking care. There are gaps in the provision of legal counseling and representation for gender-based violence cases which can impact survivors in many ways. Survivors of intimate partner violence may not be informed about their rights to have separate asylum claims from their partners, which may force them to stay in abusive and dangerous relationships. Frontline workers who may not have the tools or experience to deal effectively with the gender-specific needs of this population need additional support to incorporate gender equality programming GBV awareness, sensitization, and capacity building. Of course, the pandemic COVID-19 response mostly characterized by a strict long-term lockdown in reception centers has further exacerbated the tensions, pressures, and violence. Despite the vulnerabilities of women and girls, their reproductive health needs often go unmet. As women realize they might be stuck in camps for longer periods, they request long-term family planning options, contrary to the general assumption that they oppose family planning based on cultural norms and beliefs. Yet, not all health service providers offer these services. While contraceptives, especially long-term birth control, cannot be found in the camps. The hospitals, lack staff trained in the clinical management of rape and often do not have post-exposure prophylaxis available, putting women and girls at heightened risk for unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. Shame and stigma coming from a potentially inappropriately trained service provider also negatively affect the survivor's willingness to receive care. Raising awareness in communities is also crucial. The lack of well-trained cultural mediators, women in particular, at this time limits the access to public health services. Community engagement and leadership of women and girls is lacking. It is important to encourage women participation, providing opportunities for community cohesion, yet also to ensure sufficient funds for undisrupted operation of women's safe spaces. Many women are excluded from decision-making within the household and or the community and lack informal support networks that provide outlets for positive coping mechanisms and building resilience. The responsibility of uh, all humanitarian actors to promote gender equality is supported by a normative framework validated by extensive field experience. The main objective is to support actors in reaching 
all people affected by ensuring that the specific needs, capacities and priorities of women, girls, men and boys are identified and that assistance targets the persons and groups most in need. Also informing women, girls, men and boys of their entitlements and available resources and engaging their participation and women's leadership in program design. And finally, monitoring and evaluation, the impact of our programs and strategies on those we assist, including identifying and dismantling barriers and discrimination by promoting and enabling women's leadership at the community level and in other decision-making processes. Integrating gender into the humanitarian program cycle uh, practically means integrating gender into needs assessment and analysis, strategic planning, resource mobilization, implementation and monitoring, and finally, operational peer review and evaluation. Gender equality should be provided in the specific sectors of cash-based interventions, camp coordination and camp management, early recovery, education, food security, health, livelihoods, nutrition, protection, shelter, wash, sanitation and hygiene. Organizing monitoring visits and providing regular training on GBV prevention and response for public servants and other service providers. The governments must increase the availability and accessibility of GBV response services in all reception settings, while ensuring proper identification of survivors. Clear referral path pathways should be always available and updated. Lastly, it is not only about survivors and perpetrators. Prevention is the key. Thus, working with men is crucial. Symbiosis, which is the School of Political Studies in Greece, uh, affiliated to the Council of Europe Network of Schools, engaged since 2016 in uh, pioneering work, research, capacity building seminars on gender equality and gender violence prevention for frontline workers, cultural mediators and municipalities, as well as pilot projects on the ground, such as training refugee women as community antennas and educating male refugees. This work addresses the fact that migration can create conflicts between different ways of understanding gender, for example, in relation to views on relationships, family, children and youth, women, sexual exploitation and masculinities. We work with male migrants and refugees in the form of dialogue-oriented seminars to encourage but also challenge their reflection on the topics of gender roles, self-care, social re relations, violence prevention and caring masculinities. It is essential to produce and share this knowledge across Europe to challenge the inequalities that underpin gender-based violence in both countries of origin and host countries. Thank you very much. Thank you for that concise and instructive presentation, Mr. Renchev. Again, your expertise will really help Ms. Tinen and I to be precise in our uh, recommendations. And now I would like to go back to uh, Ms. Bejerk. Uh, yes, we can see you now, Ms. Bejerk. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I just had to uh, change device. Uh, it is very uh, an honor for me to be here. Uh, I think uh, I'm a member of the European Parliament uh, since 2014, working in the uh, Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee last legislature, and now in the Civil Liberties uh, Committee, uh, among others. But I have always had a focus on women's rights, and, and in particular also now the intersection with mi migration policies since I'm a European parliamentarian. And I think uh, as, as uh, an EU policymaker that have been, been focusing uh, on EU migration policies, I think I will, will uh, address that level because I think we have heard expertise on, on, uh, on what's happening on the field in, in different countries and, and the kind of answers we need there. And uh, I will say that in 2015, uh, I was um, what was called the Balkan route. So in Greece, and then and, and we were in, in, uh, uh, in Croatia, in Serbia, we were in, uh, in all that area. And I met uh, uh, full families uh, with three generations sometimes traveling together. 
Uh, and I think it was an enormous hardship, of course, for you know little children, uh, the whole family, older pa parents. But at the same time, there was something hopeful about that move because they were fleeing from very diff difficult and dangerous situations, uh, and they were coming as a full family uh, and, and seeking protection uh, in the European Union. Uh, and uh, I think that that you know today when I hear at at, especially here at the European Union level, that we should never get back to 2015. I am not, you know, I'm not so happy with that kind of language and that kind of narrative. Uh, and as you know, you know, there is there are, are xenophobic and even racist speech in, in Europe today that kind of uh, tries to um, demonize uh, migrants and refugees. And I think we all have a responsibility to counteract that because it, it of course, um, uh, uh, it hits on women in a very particular way also in terms of uh, minimizing their space to create a, a life and, and to, to build an independent, uh, uh, new, new protected, you know, in a protected environment. So I think we, we have uh, that responsibility and we have to look at EU and national policies to see that why, what are we doing wrong to the, uh, to the extent that women and children are so unsafe and so vulnerable when they are on the move. And uh, if I look at the European Union level, it is very clear that since 2015, the borders have been closing down, the reception uh, uh, conditions have been worsening, uh, the rights of refugees and migrants have been uh, stripped. So uh, as a direct consequence of that, I would say that the more vulnerable uh, uh, people on the move they, they uh, are the hardest hit by these policies. So that, that is, among others, children, unaccompanied minors, and women, uh, migrants and asylum seekers. So we have to have a deep look at the, more, the general picture of EU policymaking in this area. And certainly there are many of us in the European Parliament and at national different levels that work for uh, policies that actually protect the most vulnerable, that protect women, that protect children on the move. Uh, and we have a, pr a responsibility to do that throughout the process because EU policies also have uh, consequences in third countries and even more so because policymakers want to act in, in third countries as, as, uh, um, as um, not only in the EU countries. So uh, I have been to Niger Nigeria, I've been to Bosnia, Herzegovina, I've seen the situation there and I think the EU has a big responsibility for the, the, the distress and the, the horrible uh, 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 re refugee and reception conditions that are there. And like uh, also so, of course, I've been to Moria and to Lesbos and seen the situation there. Uh, and I think it's a European uh, shameful situation. Uh, I looked, uh, you know, as, as the European Parliament, we have worked on the issue of migrant and refugee women. We have a report from 2016. It addresses uh, um, different uh, elements of, of uh, policies that need to be in place. It looks at refugee status determination, uh, where of course gender specific yeah, asylum claims, uh, where we need more knowledge, we need more expertise, we need also guidelines to, to, for them to, to be uh, um, uh, implemented, because the legislation in that, but the implementation uh, is, is sometimes lacking. Uh, this uh, report also highlights something that is, is becoming increasingly um, applied, the concept of safe third country, but that's a very uh, tricky concept, especially for vulnerable asylum seekers and for, for, for women. So that is put in, I think we all have to put that into question. Uh, and also one thing that is extremely important is to uh, make sure that uh, women can make um, independent claims from their uh, spouse uh, and from uh, other family members and that they have to be informed about that in the asylum process. Um, the reception conditions uh, have uh, been, been addressed by other uh, panelists and I think, however, that at European level, uh, at EU level, we need to really, really take a, take a very critical look at what is happening and I've seen enough on the Greek islands, as I said, in Bosnia, but also I've been to Canary Islands. I've seen what is happening and this is not dignified. It's not dignified, it's not 2021 the way, you know, we, we should treat uh, people and, you know, Europe can do so much better than that. Uh, and I think we all have a responsibility to, to reform those policies away from detention and to open centers and also not to, of course, 
the main issue here is relocation from Greece, from Spain, from other countries to the rest of the European member states. Uh, just to say a few things also about the issue of social inclusion and integration. I think uh, here uh, several speakers have, have already talked about education, uh, about the need for welfare services to be functioning. And I think we have to be very clear there uh, that uh, it is by, by investing in people and in, in, uh, in women and children that we may make uh, inclusion and integration a success story. And we see moves today where unfortunately welfare in general is actually being cut, which has specific effects and also, of course, on, on, on migrants and refugee women and children. And I think that we, you know, welfare is something that everyone has the right to. It's not a reward. It is like a basis to have our societies to function properly. So some, in some countries now, you know, welfare is being cut and it's being cut for refugees and migrants and it's being, you know, and, and it should be seen as, as something that maybe you can, can get if, if, if. I think that's a dangerous path to walk because it's the floor and from that people can stand and they can walk and they can take, you know, new steps in, in a new country. And, and that's the, the, the role that welfare services and welfare society has. So I think we have to be clear that that's not the reward, it's right, and that's a, it's a prerequisite for, for, for integration and inclusion. Uh, just to finish off, I would say that uh, the situation then for, for migrant women um, and refugee women and their families has, has deteriorated the last the last few years, and much so because of the, the changing tide of, of, um, of political narrative in Europe. And I think we have to work to change that narrative. I think we have to work for legal pathways for both refugees and migrants, uh, you know, labor migration. I think we have to work for a proper search and rescue system in the Mediterranean, because uh, the situation there is very, very serious. And uh, as I said, uh, we have to, at the European Union level, uh, which I know, you know, the, the, the Council of Europe is such an important partner to keep us up to our, our uh, um, commitments, international commitments, and to do better, uh, to make sure that we actually apply uh, relocation and shared responsibilities so that we don't, uh, you know, fuel uh, detention-like systems. And uh, uh, as the former speaker said, uh, migration is part of human story, and uh, we have rights uh, on, uh, and, and we, there are international commitments, and we have to deliver upon those, not derive from them. We have to deliver, and I think the Council of Europe is such an important partner in in doing that. So uh, thank you for for uh, having me here today. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bajuric, for this insightful speech. It's always useful to see what the European Parliament is doing in all uh, of our areas of work, and important to make connections with you to compare notes and exchange uh, information. Thank you. Um, I would like to now give the floor to experts who will launch our discussion, beginning with Cecile Grebowal from the Council of Europe's Gender Equality Commission, who will explain about the new Council of Europe recommendation on migrant women the Commission is currently working on. Ms. Grebowal, you have the floor. Good morning. and. Uh... Many thanks to the, the Parliamentary Assembly to give me the floor to uh, uh, give you some uh, information about the work of the Council of Europe from the intergovernmental uh, side. So that's the, the work indeed of the Gender Equality Commission. And I have a presentation that I would like uh, to share. So to give you a bit of context, um, the, the issue of uh, migration from a gender perspective is a little bit new uh, for the Gender Equality Commission because this was integrated in um, the Gender Equality Strategy uh, in 2018. And, uh, the, the task that was given to the Gender Equality Commission was actually uh, mostly to update uh, an existing recommendation on migrant and refugee women. So, of course, um, the, the aim with this is really to try and uh, 
improve the protection of the human rights uh, of migrant, refugee, and asylum-seeking women and girls, and um, what the Gender, Equal uh, Committee, uh, Gender Equality Commission wanted to do with this was really to make um, those issues more visible in, in policy making and uh, of course to uh, look at the violation of human rights, violence against women, trafficking, etc. But also to um, look at existing uh, policies and standards that would best uh, protect those rights. And this is uh, the aim of the drafting committee that is currently working on a new text. So this text is currently being negotiated, so I can't give you um, all the details of what's in there, but I can tell you a little bit about the structure and the content, and uh, also, of course, uh, indicate that we have been consulting with NGOs, uh, with different sectors of the Council of Europe to try and find the best possible uh, provisions to protect rights. So what we hope to achieve in terms of, uh, of calendar is that the, this new recommendation is adopted in, by the Committee of Ministers sometime next year. Now, uh, as to the, the content of the recommendation, uh, in terms of scope, the, the, the drafting committee has, has decided that this will address the all, all stages of uh, the migration process and also asylum and integration policies. And what was also very important is that we wanted to look at uh, all uh, migrant, refugee, and asylum-seeking women and girls, and of course also have a, an intersectional perspective to really address the needs of specific groups who, who, which are in a particular uh, vulnerable situation, such as girls in particular, but also undocumented migrant women, women with disabilities, uh, single mothers, and, and the groups that were also identified by, identified by um, previous speakers. So in the text, we have a series of horizontal issues, uh, which I won't list them all, but we have, of course, access to justice. We have a cooperation with civil society. Uh, of course, also the need to have more knowledge about the situation on the ground through data collection and research, which must be uh, gender disaggregated. Um, and then looking into the content of the Recommendation, uh, that's the, the next slide. Uh, we have a we have a first uh, section about protection and support. And this is pretty much based on the, the provision of the Istanbul Convention and of the, our trafficking, our, our anti-trafficking convention. And the, the aim here is really to look uh, from a very comprehensive perspective at the situation of victims of gender-based violence and trafficking, in particular trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. We put a lot of um, focus on training uh, and also on um, uh, support services, which must be gender specific, and also access to ch shelters, because we also know, uh, notably from the Gravio reports, that access to shelters um, for migrant women, or especially also depending on their mi migration status, is a real challenge. So this. Um, this is really a, a very short summary of what we, we want to include in, in relation to protection. Then we have a section on, uh, could you go back please? To, oops. We have, sorry. we have a section on arrival, which pretty much looks at um, transit and the reception facilities where we would like to, we list provisions that aim to, in, uh, to ensure age and gender sensitive uh, infrastructures, access to services, support and complaint mechanism, and again, uh, training, gender sensitive training of staff, the presence of women among staff, and of course, uh, a section about asylum and the need for gender sensitive asylum policies. When uh, we look at the, the next section, uh, this is about residence and integration. The next slide, please. 
And this is really to look at um, integration policies and the whole spectrum of services in relation to health, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, which was, of course, mentioned before, social security, housing, education, and uh, um, the, the sensitive issue of residence permit and family reunion. Uh, in particular, of course, the autonomous right to, to residence permits, uh, as provided also by the Istanbul Convention. And then looking at detention, another quite sensitive issue. Uh, our work was also based, of course, on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, but also the work of the Council of Europe, um, CPT, uh, looking at the an age and gender sensitive approach to all aspects of deprivation of liberty and also uh, looking at uh, administrative detention, which uh, we see as a last resort in the context of migration. And finally, we have um, a chapter on, on returns, which should be in safety and dignity, uh, looking also at uh, non refoulement and uh, gender uh, sensitive aspects of uh, country of origin, of course. So uh, this is in a nutshell the, the draft that we have. Uh, the work of the drafting committee is available if you want to have a, a closer look. We very much hope that the, we'll have a, a strong text that is quite comprehensive to address all these uh, aspects of the, the human rights of uh, migrant, refugee, and asylum-seeking women. And hopefully, this kind of uh, uh, codifying exercise of this existing uh, standards will help giving guidance to the member states uh, to improve the situation on the ground and protect those human rights. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next person to whom I will give the floor is Professor Jenny Fillimore from Birmingham University, who is a professor of migration and a leading scholar on refugee integration, super diversity, and access to social welfare. Professor Fillimore, you have the floor. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and it's really good to be involved in this conversation. It's extremely important. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the findings of the Sarida project, which is a project looking at sexual and gender-based violence and forced migration uh, across, it's an international project, but we focus on Turkey, Sweden, and UK. Um, we've interviewed over 200 SGBV survivors and nearly 100 stakeholders, including NGOs, international um, organizations, municipalities, health uh, services, and more. And uh, our findings really reflect uh, the content of the conversation today. And what I really want to stress is um, the importance of understanding women migrants' experiences as a continuum of violence, which starts pre-displacement, continues through conflict, often escalated in flight, and uh, continues on arrival. Uh, so it's important to try to understand the um, impact of all those cumulative experiences and how that creates multiple traumas. What we find um, is that, uh, as others have mentioned, uh, the journey is particularly perilous, um, especially for bo at borders where generally people are considered illegal and highly risky, um, and in camps. So it's especially dangerous and there are multiple perpetrators. Um, we hear reports from women of physical and psychological harms, often both, often untreated, and a complete lack of services en route, and very low levels of services in, on arrival in, in Europe. Um, on arrival, the violence tends to continue. Um, so we have uh, lots of examples of women who are dependent um, on abusers, we call this violent dependency, and this is because of their immigration status. So we make them dependents, and their um, continual uh, presence in Europe very much depends on being in a relationship with an abuser. Um, we often also provide few opportunities for escape, there aren't enough safe houses, there aren't enough services. Discriminant, discrimination and racism are frequently reported and prevent women from reaching out to wider communities for fear of further discrimination and racism. And generally we find um, that regardless of the country that we're looking at, 
um, the asylum and immigration systems do not protect women's human rights. So lots and lots of information about um, traumatic asylum interviews, gender mismatch um, with interviewers, um, community um, interpreters who threaten women about revealing what's actually happened to them, fear of disclosure, and the lack of ability of asylum caseworkers to support sensitive dis disclosure, interviews that can take 10 hours sometimes without a break, and then no access to any kind of counselling afterwards. So very different to the way that we treat our own citizens. Lots of um, examples of unsafe housing where women have been sexually harassed by other residents, but also by um, the people employed by the state to keep them safe. No action taken when they try to report sexual harassment or fear of being uh, creating trouble and that undermining their asylum claim. A strong relationship between detention and PTSD. Women waiting years um, for a, an asylum decision. Uh, living in perpetual fear of return to the um, SGBV that they uh, prompted their original um, need to escape. Uh, we also see a cycle of destitution where people are in and out of asylum systems while their claims are considered, refused, then they're appealing, and in this period they become very, very vulnerable to continued SGBV. And finally, as mentioned by the previous speaker, um, inability to integrate. Um, one of the things that we find really helps women to move forward beyond the trauma is to be able to be hopeful and to change their lives and to move on with their lives in a very constructive way. Uh, and that's, that's tricky when you don't have the right status, but even when you do have the status, there's a lack of um, instruments to help women to move on. So what we need really is to focus on safety and um, services during flight, uh, looking at minimising harm prevention, of course, would be ideal, and ensuring recovery after they've arrived within Europe. There's evidence, um, as one of the speakers said, that work with men really does de-escalate violence, but we need to create a humane asylum system, um, address the socioeconomic stresses that generally create vulnerabilities and generate an intensification of cycles of violence. Um, so we really need to be looking at ensuring that people have a decent quality of life. The recommendations that we've just heard about on migrant women are really pertinent, really appropriate, exactly the kind of recommendations that we've come up with the project in the project. But we have to move beyond recommendations to actually implementing these. That takes resource, it takes political will. And some states already have gender sensitive policies that remain on the shelf. And those people that enact the policies, certainly the frontline bureaucrats, um, are, 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 are not aware of them, don't know how to implement them, or don't have the resource to do so. So just to, to, to reinforce the need for these recommendations, but let's make sure that they actually happen. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you, Professor Fillimore, for this very important um, uh, presentation, which will be very useful for our uh, report. In the interest of time, I will speak the, uh, skip the Q&A session. Now, it's with great pleasure that I hand over the role of moderator to my esteemed colleague, Ms. Petra Sitinen, who will guide us through the second part of the webinar. Thanks to all of you for participating and for making this a great panel. And over to you, Petra. Uh, it's, uh, it has been such a rich conversation uh, already. I mean, I'm taking notes and thank you for all the speakers. I will reflect a little bit about what I heard and then go into our session and uh, ask the speakers to be ready within five, five minutes. Um, I liked what uh, the last speaker said about it's not about recommendations only it's about implementing it's about political will and i think we need to talk about leadership of parliamentarians of policy makers of politicians um melon Björk talked about um, what are we doing wrong and i have to say that of course a lot of things are being done right thank you very much mrs altentash for your um presentation about what the turkish government and people are doing and I think we should be appreciative of the countries um, that are taking in so many migrants and refugees. 
But we still have to ask the question, what are we doing wrong? And I think for the countries in the European Union and in many of the Council of Europe states, migration has become a security threat. And that might be one of the issues here. Um, and also migration has been seen for a very long time as a gender neutral issue. We talk, I'm sorry to say, but sometimes it's almost as if we talk about a cookie factory and not about human people, or about human beings. And so how can we change the narrative? How can we change the discussion? Maybe we have to look more at the humanitarian side. Maybe we have to look more at safety instead of security. And I think in my country, uh, integration falls under the Ministry of Social Affairs. Uh, asylum and migration falls under the Ministry of Justice. And emancipation falls under the Ministry of Education. So the, the policy makers and the policies are scattered. Now, we're going to look in the second session of this webinar at gender equality and migration policies. I think we can learn a lot from the lessons um, that the Security Council 1325 gives us, women, peace and security. How can we make this more political? We, I think we can also learn a lot from how we have dealt with the COVID um, impact on society, but especially on women and girls. And Mrs. Altentaj already referred to it. I wrote a report for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on upholding human rights in times of COVID and gender equality and non-discrimination. And I think the conclusions of that report might be helpful for, might be helpful for our conversation of today. There were three conclusions. If we really want to integrate um, protection of human rights in how we deal with a crisis, and I think we're facing a gender crisis as well when it comes to migration and integration, we need to look at diversity of measures. That's number one. Secondly, we need a differentiation of data. We need to know what we're talking about. The fact that we have 50-50% men, women in migration, what does that tell, tell us? That's not enough information. And thirdly, and probably most importantly also for this session, is we need a differentiation of voices and representation. Who are these women that migrate? They're not one monolithic block. There are women who are well-educated, who could if they had the opportunity, integrate very quickly, but they are seen as, I know, and I'm sorry to say so, but I know of friends who come from a Muslim majority country, they're wearing a headscarf and they go to an employment agency and they're being told, well, you can become a cleaner. And there's nothing wrong with the profession of a cleaner, but if you have a university degree and you could be a doctor, that might not be a good use of your talent. To conclude, before I give uh, the word to the Deputy Minister of Migration and Asylum from Greece, it's very nice to have you with us. Um, I think it's very important also to emphasize that for me as a rapporteur, a gender perspective doesn't only mean a women's perspective. I think some of the previous speakers alluded to the importance of including men and boys, but also looking at the vulnerabilities of men and boys in the migration and integration process, because I think some of the aspects of violence weave into each other. If men and boys and their needs are not taken seriously, what does that mean for them? Are they a victim, are they a, victim a perpetrator of violence? I mean, we need to look this, at this in a holistic way, you know. Uh, and I think we should stop putting the word women and gender in our reports, almost like stirring some women in the glass and not really doing anything in action. So that would be my introduction. And I'm very happy to have three distinguished speakers with us. Um, the people who are uh, joining us, we are trying to keep our presentations as brief as possible. So we will have plenty of time for a conversation. So I will start waving after five minutes to each of our speakers. Um, which means that you have one, two minutes left. I would really, really urge you to uh, leave time for uh, a conversation with the people who are uh, watching in. You can actually use the chat function and the secretariat will help us. So without much further ado, I I'm very happy to give the floor to Mrs. Vultepsi, Ms. Sofia Vultepsi, who is the Deputy Minister of Migration and Asylum from Greece.
the floor is yours. Yes, good morning to everybody. Good morning, dear Petra. Yes, I'm now Deputy Minister for Integration. Before, uh, of course, I'm member of the Parliament, and before I was President of the of the Parliamentary Commission for uh, for Equality. So I have an idea about all the field. Uh, what we meet here and what we see here uh, at the field, I mean, with all of that experience we had from the migration crisis, is that it is very important to enforce women in order to to arrive to to the the gender e equality. Uh, we have a new national strategy and we, are, we intend to implement it uh, in all over Greece, in the camps and not only in the camps. And this is, includes special curses for the gender equality and the prevention of all forms of, of, of violence. Because there are other problems also, problems of trafficking and everything that, you know, uh, this is a field that women are more vulnerable. So we have to, to take care of this. Um, we already, in collaboration with the Pantheon University for Social Science uh, and the National Rapporteur for the Trafficking, we already have uh, our, our studies in order to start doing this at the field in the camps. What I can tell you for sure is that from our experience on unaccompanied children, which, you know, we have here in Greece, we have half and a half, half men, half women. And uh, the, the same, I could say the same we have uh, on the field of the children. What we see is that it is more easier with the children. I mean, we start from the age of 10 years old, and now have children here of 16, 17 years old. They are going to be adult uh, in a year. It, it, it became more easier for them to understand all these problems and behave in the way of uh, gender equality. What I'm thinking to do is, is to strengthen migrant women and refugee women uh, to have a work, because this is very important. Most of the women stay, you know, in the camps or in the houses, but uh, even if they have skills, they can work on this. And we are going to have a program with, um, with the EC in order to enforce women to find a work and stay out of the house and uh, uh, do what they can according to their uh, what they can according to their skills. This is one program we are going to start very quickly, and we are going also to start a new program for the unaccompanied children who become adults because it is different. Uh, there are people here moving, coming in Greece and then going back. Uh, they, do, they get asylum or they don't take asylum. But these children that now are men and women of uh, 17 and 18 year, uh, years old, and we have more than 3,000 here in Greece, uh, they have to stay here and find the work and uh, respect the gender equality. So, uh, we, we try to work with the children and to secure women doing something in their life. I'm, I can tell you that we have a lot of women without husbands. So the, we have women with children. So if we want to, to, to give a profession to, the, to these women, we, we have to, to do something with the children. Uh, we try to do something parallel in the camps. I mean, to have the skills for the mothers and the school uh, for the children. And that's why we try to have a pre-integration stadium. We started with this. Yesterday we signed with UNICEF for a huge program of three years for this pre-integration and the bridge between uh, non-formal and formal education. So we have uh, all children in the, in the, on the pave of education and mothers can do something different at the same time and strength, strengthen themselves. Um, okay, it's, uh, in uh, summer, we're going to get this new national strategy uh, on, you know, on the internet, so everybody will see how we try to do it. And then we're going to have it at the parliament, 
uh, in order to be decided by the, the MPs. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to take your time. I mean, there are a lot of things because uh, after so many years, we, 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 are in, we can now have the categories of people who, which we can help. Uh, and it is easier when we do it under an umbrella. Uh, so everybody does the same thing, same thing uh, in all the camps. We have more than 30 camps here in Greece. So we have a lot of people. We have uh, in the camps at about 55,000 5, people. So if you think that the half of them are the women, uh, one third is uh, children, I mean, it's uh, it's it's not very easy to achieve all this, but uh, okay, I believe I'll try to do it. That's why I'm here, and uh, of course, uh, it is a very, very important and very useful to have these conversations between us and exchange our ideas, and uh, so we can have new ideas. I mean, what an idea is that it, the the most important for us is that we found out that mother mothers with children who arrive in Greece. They, they go to the camp and then th those mothers have to deal with children who are 12 or 13 years old and they have to go to school but they know one word in Greek so they cannot go in school and they get disappointed and then they go, don't go to the school. So we try to do all together mothers, children and uh, okay. find a profession for all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Um, if I may ask you, I know that you're pressed for time, but if I may ask you one question also from for you as a politician. I mean, I'm looking for my report also for ways that political leadership, um, you uh, within the European Union, but also within the Council of Europe, how can you influence your colleagues at the table who might not have this holistic view of the issue at hand, how can you invite your colleagues, your male colleagues, or maybe your female colleagues, that we really need to have a gender perspective on migration? Yes, we have to have a gender perspective on everything. I mean, you know, uh, we yeah. try, we women try a lot. I mean, we try to prove things that nobody ha has to, to, to prove. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, we, uh, for me, it's a double fight. I have to, all, in all my life, I'm not young anymore, but in all my life, I had to, to prove that I can do something even if I am a woman, and then to, to try to do politics on other people and try to have equality for everybody. It's, you know, it's a difficult, for all women, it's a difficult task. I mean, that's why they used to say that uh, just to be a woman, it's a political act. Yeah, well, I'm so grateful that we have you on this panel. Um, and I believe in the amplification of different voices. So let's try to amplify each other's voices for indeed more attention for gender and everything, but absolutely also in migration and integration. So yes. thank you for your uh, contribution. Thank and you. I know you have to leave pretty soon. And I hope that we will be able to meet in person one day somewhere, either in Greece or... Yes, in that will be wonderful. I mean, with this coronavirus crisis, I mean, yeah, it was thank a problem. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everything. Bye. Bye. It's a great honor for me to move from The Hague virtually yeah. to Amsterdam, which is a 45-minute yeah. train ride. But um, the next speaker, I know that he is in Amsterdam. He is uh, Mr. Remha Kiros, working at the Migration Policy Department of the Ministry of Justice and Security in the Netherlands. We zouden dit in het Nederlands kunnen doen, maar er zijn geen tolken van Nederlands naar andere talen. I just said we could do this in Dutch, but as there are no interpreters from Dutch to other languages, we will be polite and speak um, English. The floor is yours, Remha. And also keep it between five and six minutes. I'll do my best. Thank you, Mevrouw Stina. I would, I, I have to start in Dutch a little bit at least. But uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Stina, and thank you for organizing uh, this webinar as well. I think it's uh, an important subject, and it is an honor for me to uh, speak here between these distinguished uh, speakers and before our distinguished attendees. 
Um, now, obviously, I'm not mandated to speak uh, on behalf of the Dutch government, or I'm not an academic heavyweight as the other panelists are, but uh, I can speak to my own experience with respect to uh, gender equality and then specifically pertaining to the migration uh, field. Uh, in general, I would like to start uh, by noting that gender equality is an important topic within the Dutch government in general. And uh, this is reflected in the most recent policy plan uh, by the government where they identified three domains, uh, the labor market, safety, security and acceptance, and then also gender diversity and equal treatment. Now, as Ms. Steenen already noted, the labor market is uh, part of the social uh, affairs ministry then gender diversity in general falls within the Ministry of Education, and then the safety, security, and acceptance as it pertains to migration falls within uh, the Ministry of Justice. But within my own field and within my own ministry, I do see all these three domains reflected in a different uh, level. So for example, with respect to the labor market and the gender diversity and equal treatment, I can tell you that uh, the Ministry of Justice as an active effort to ensure that within five years uh, there's a balanced, rep balanced representation of men and women in the most senior positions within the ministry. So this already is a step towards differentiating the voices uh, as far as the policy making goes in that field. And then if we look into the matter of the safety, security and acceptance, uh, with regards to migration, there's already uh, many policies in place in the Netherlands to ensure that uh, the safety and security and acceptance of migrant women and girls are, are safeguarded. Uh, I can give you some examples, such as uh, gender-specific grounds for asylum protection. Uh, there are specific uh, specific permits for victims of honor-related or domestic-related violence, and also victims of human trafficking. And then these applications for these particular permits are handled by a separate unit uh, that has specialized in gender-related issues. But in general, within the interviewing process, there's always attention for specific vulnerabilities, and it's always offered to be interviewed by a female interviewer or an interpreter, for example. And then within reception facilities, there are also certain gender specific policies in place, for example, trainings about the position of women and equal rights in the Netherlands. There are specific employees who are focused on recognizing uh, signs of unrelated violence, domestic violence and sexual violence, but also forced marriage, for example. And there are specific training uh, trainings for uh, women migrants within the reception centers focused on their physical and mental resilience and defensibility. And these are just some examples I could go on, but in you know, looking at the time, I would like to keep it briefer than that. But as you can see, there's already a lot in place in the Netherlands. So you can imagine my surprise when I started getting signals last summer that there were still women and girls who felt that there was insufficient protection for them and that they have insufficient time to process traumas they may have experienced either in the country of origin or along their migration route. So this brings me to my main point, actually. Uh, which is who are the parties or the stakeholders that are actually influencing the policy, right? So these points of critique came forward during uh, consultation sessions for a national action plan on women, peace and security in uh, the spirit of the UN resolution 1325. And during these sessions, there were obviously the bigger uh, organizations who are always well represented when it comes to policy making, but there were also many smaller uh, migrant women led uh, founded organizations who had experienced themselves within the procedures uh, that are set out by my ministry and within the asylum procedure. And they were the ones that voiced these concerns. And these are concerns that don't usually reach us, right? And then the added value of hearing them is twofold. So first of all, you're getting input and feedback from people who have experienced the policies you've put in place. And then secondly, they can offer insights into solutions for problems you may not have even considered. An example of this is, uh, like I mentioned, there are trainings for women's physical and mental resilience in the reception facilities. But the main critique point that we heard from these organizations is that while it's good that these uh, trainings are available, that does not necessarily mean that you're reaching all the women that you want to reach. And I think that also uh, touches on what Ms. Steenen said earlier, um, that there's a difference between uh, the, the the cultures and the educational background of these women and not everyone is susceptible to the same uh, policies or the same practice. So there's still a group that is out of sight, so to speak, and it's not reached by these activities. And in those instances, it's truly of an added value to have someone who has experienced these uh, policies and that can inform you on how to make sure that you can include and how you can reach the people who have fallen out of your sight without you even knowing. 
Now, uh, we are still in the middle of the process of working with these uh, migrant women organizations. It's, it's something that we started recently, but the experience is already very positive uh, for us, obviously, because of the reason I mentioned before, but also for them. Uh, the knowledge that they have is very valuable, but it's oftentimes not easy for them to have access to the policymakers. So to be heard by us is already uh, a big deal for them, but then it's also up to us as policymakers to actually follow up on the input that we have received for them and to implement policies with their input and with their feedback. Um, well, so if I could summarize my contribution, it will be as follows. Uh, it's really important to have the right stakeholders at the table when you're developing these policies. Now, I got lucky in this instance and I met them in this consultation session, but I do believe that there's room for us as policymakers to look past these usual suspects and dig a little bit deeper to make sure we can get firsthand information and input. And then secondly, to be aware of our blind spots. Like I said, there are issues that you don't have a side on and the fact that there are policies in place does not necessarily mean that they reach everyone that you want to reach. So be critical and be aware of your own blind spots. Um, I think I will leave it Thank at this. You. Yes, uh, I hope this has been useful and I look forward to answering yes, any questions absolutely. you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if I may add, and we will definitely include that, as Mrs. Uh, Celik said, that she wants to represent the good examples from Turkey. I think there are some very good examples from the Netherlands as well. There is an organization called Open Embassy and they uh, work together with municipalities and they actually do what Mr. Kiros just said. They're bringing in uh, the expertise of people who have received uh, protection in the Netherlands, but they will share with uh, officials or policymakers from the municipalities what their procedures actually meant for them. And I think uh, I will actually ask the people from Open to Embassy whether they have a gender perspective on this. I do have one, last, uh, one question about uh, Mr. Kiris. Rem Harry said that we would be on first name uh, basis. Yeah. I said gender perspective is no, no, not only a women's perspective. I feel how can we prevent ourselves as politicians, policymakers, media, that we only see women as victims and men as perpetrators? because it's not that uh, dichotomy, the, the dichotomy doesn't really work. How, how do you see this? How can we be more holistic about uh, the issue of gender and also including the male perspective or the perspective of men and boys in such a way that they're not only the perpetrators, but also agents for change? Yes, I think that's a very good, but also a very difficult question. Um, I do think that, uh, and it's something one of the previous speakers touched on, prevention is the key, right? So it, it's part of reaching uh, men and boys, but also women and, and girls, and uh, broadening their scope as far as gender roles might uh, might be, and then showing the, the possibilities that they have to be agents of change throughout, uh, throughout the role uh, within their families or whatever. Um, but I think uh, education is a part of that. So uh, outreach uh, in, a, in a very early stage, I believe, uh, as part of, for example, trainings at reception shelters or interactions with, uh, with officials at a very, very early age in, uh, in their procedures. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. And I, I always say that uh, the training, yes, uh, training and expertise is a two-way street. Um, I can see quite often that people who work in municipalities are not always aware of the intricacies of different cultures, people with different backgrounds, and that they fall into stereotypes, sometimes from good intentions, but good intentions can still be very painful on the receiving side. So uh, I think we should be aware of this. Well, thank you very much. Raman, please stay with us if you have time. And for the people uh, watching, I'm really keeping a, a strict eye on the time because I would really like you to be involved as well. So you can write your questions to the panelists, to me, uh, or observations. If you have to share something, please write it in the chat. And I will be informed by the amazing secretariat behind um, this webinar on the questions. So please participate with us because I think we will have a good 20 minutes left for a conversation with the people in the in the room, so to say. Well, now we're going to Barcelona. Uh, oh, I, this morning I saw a picture of the beach in Barcelona, which is quite full. So, um, but you're with us. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, Gemma Pignol Jiménez.
you are the director of migration policies and diversity with the Spanish think tank in strategies and you're also an associated professor at the Gritem UPF University in Barcelona. Um, buenos dias, uh, the floor is yours and for you as well if you can keep it to six seven minutes. Thank you very much and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, being at the end of the seminar, it's complicated to add something because I think that has been a very interesting uh, and a lot of full uh, ideas during the during the session. So I'm going to point out some ideas just in order to give uh, food for thought. And uh, for sure, you are uh, absolutely allowed to mute me if I'm past my time. So don't worry about that. You can mute me because this is the advantages of the virtual world in any case. So let me start with three quick considerations that I need, we need always to put in the table when we talk about migration and, and gender issues. And the, the first is that we are not talking about migration as a human phenomenon, is it, but we talk about migration as a crisis constantly. And this is an idea that it's in our minds all the time. That affects migration, that affects migrants in general, but it also has an impact for sure in uh, female migrants. And I think this is a question that we need to, to put in the agenda because it's one of the um, proposals that I'm going to, <laughs> to do after that. The second one is that uh, women, are, women are the half, we are the half of the, EU, the, the human population, but at some point it seems that we are treated in public policies as a minority something that is discovered at some point in the in the road. And this is a, something that happens not only in migration and asylum, and I'm sorry to say that also in integration policies, but in general. But I think that this uh, gender blindness of public policies happens a lot on migration, and it, this is also a thing that we need to understand that we are uh, in a very uh, situation of a gap situation from the very beginning. And the second one, uh, the second element in this uh, line, is probably third, is that Women are trait as we are vulnerable. We are not vulnerable people. We face vulnerable situations because the context, the system, the general situation pro, uh, give us or put us um, uh, facing these, uh, vulnerable, uh, these situations. And this is a thing that we need also to take in consideration. We don't need only to be seen as a part of a vulnerable group. We need to understand that our vulnerabilities are part of the system that we need to change. And changing is not only through migration policies. Migration policies could play a role for sure, but it's not only. What I'm trying to say with that is that we cannot uh, ask migration policies to correct or help in questions that are broader than that and that we face and we need to face as a general context that we need to change. So uh, in this sense, to fight this gender, to, to, sorry, this gender blindness or the gender stereotypes that I think that are part of how we think public policies regarding um, women, I just uh, have some considerations. And are considerations that I think that it's some just to share, meaning it's not a, a list of ditties for politicians or something like that, but it's questions that I need, I think that we need to, to think about. And the first thing is that we need to change the framing. We need to change the framing in terms, we need to stop about migration as a crisis, we need to stop uh, as migration as a threat of security, and we need to stop uh, talking about women as vulnerable persons. So we need to rephrase all this. And then, of course, we need to change the policymaking process. The policymaking process is not in this moment uh, good enough because we need to incorporate the gender perspective in all migration rules, in all migration uh, legislation, and also, and very important, in all migration practices. This is why when uh, all uh, my colleagues are talking about training, uh, it's important, it's basic. Uh, because we can have very, very nice set of uh, legislation that it's cute and nice in the paper and then the practices are horrible. So we need to uh, combine this control about the legislation, check and recheck every law to see how we talk about family reunion, how we talk about labor, in, uh, labor market, how we talk about uh, questions of uh, reintegration, everything. We have to put the, uh, the gender perspective on that. Uh, then and um, we think that it's necessary in order to do that, comm commitment and compromise. It's, 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 it's easy to say, but it's complicated to, to reach. Meaning, we are, uh, if we need to change this, we need a lot of compromise, political compromise, social, social compromise, and commitment in, in doing that. And also, multi-level cooperation. Because I think that this is not a question that it's only facing uh, to national states. 
meaning national states can uh, manage legislation, national legislation and rules, but integration policies are mainly done at regional and local level. And we also need to check that in order to avoid something that has already been said about the stereotyping. Uh, we treat in a lot of integration policies that we have in check, we treat women as partners, meaning the spouse of someone, or parents, the mothers of someone. But there are more, and there are, as, as we need to treat uh, them as an individual and to understand the, the needs that they have as an individual person, not only as a part of a family group that always we need to keep also in mind, but we need to, to balance. Because this, for me, uh, is the most important thing. Co we balance protecting women that are in vulnerable situations without taking in consideration that women are all the time in a vulnerable situation. I don't know if it's clear what I'm trying to say, but we need to keep that in balance because it's really important. Meaning, we need to try to recognize, and you better have said that, women has a lot of uh, skills and qualifications that we underestimate. So we need to promote a better recognition of skills and, uh, and qualifications and give women information to, to reach that. But at the same time, we need to take in consideration that a lot of women are working in care and domestic services, and we also need to protect that because they are in a vulnerable situation, because it's not about the migration situation, it's about labor market, always generates a lot of irregularity in care and domestic service uh, systems. So we need to uh, to take that in that. So we need to rethink this family reunion, I said before, labor market recognition, for sure, avoiding discrimination. And finally, and I promise that I'm, it's the last, we need better and more research and data about that. Because what I'm being talking is about trying to pick up a lot of information, a lot of data that I more or less find over where, but we don't have really a strong, comparable and um, uh, robust data in a lot of topics. And in order to change and in order to rethink and reshape uh, legislations, narrative and uh, practices, I think that we also need to have a better and more comparable information. So thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of you that you've been so brief and concise and uh, giving us a lot of information. I have two questions for you, Gemma. First, it's um, when, when I look at, I mean, from my work and my experience also with women um, from the Mediterranean who came either as a wife a daughter or a new fiancée to the Netherlands who weren't born in the Netherlands, so who really migrated to the Netherlands, often as a, as a migrant, but also quite often as a, as a refugee. I feel that many of these women, regardless of their education or background or skills, are between a rock and a hard place because their context, their family demands from them that they stick with the culture of their country of origin. And then the, so at home, and I know that I'm generalizing a little bit, but you know, in many cases, um, it's, it's upholding the culture from back home. I see this also with migrants from the Netherlands who left in the fifties to Australia and Canada. They, they celebrate our national uh, feast in a way which my grandmother did, but which we don't do anymore nowadays. So that's the one hand. On the other hand, the environment in the Netherlands, and I guess this is true in many other European countries as well, wants them, the women, all levels, to be Dutch. And what to be Dutch means, or to be Austrian, or to be French, or to be Swedish or Spanish, has not been defined. But it's very implicit. So how do how do how can we find out what kind of maneuvering space we can create as politicians, as journalists, as researchers to to enable people to get women to get out of this double bind? And I know that this is true for men as well, but I think less so than for women. What do you think? Sure. Emma? I think it's a very interesting uh, question, and it's like, a, 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 can I have an you don't know to answer that? No, because meaning that it's a very huge yeah. question, because this is a very important question. But just in order to try to put some ideas, because it's uh, it's impossible to answer that. We need to understand that uh, when a person moves to another country, it's normal that they want to keep part of the culture for sure. It's part of where our identities are, these kind of things. That we, this is not a problem itself. The problem is when 
we try to create this idea of oppositions between one uh, being part of a community or mean that you are not part of the other. So I think that this is one of the things that we need to fight. And in, in the case of women, we need to fight that through human rights legislation, because this is what we are doing. We can decide whatever we want, but uh, in our minds, in, in, in democratic societies, we need to have in mind um, how to fight uh, discrimination and how to protect the uh, rights of being unequal and treat equal in all society. How we do that? Because this is very nice to say. How we do that? I think that uh, in the in the Council of Europe, and this is my experience uh, being an expert of a uh, of the intercultural city project in the Council of Europe, this is the way to do that, promoting interculturalism. Because uh, differently from other systems like assimilationism or multiculturalism, interculturalism is based in diversity, is based in equality, and is based in interaction. Because when you promote interaction between people, when you find what is what we share, despite what we are different of, it's when we try to create a better society. And this is very easy to do that at local level, in the neighborhood, because you can create this idea of belonging to a territory, belonging to a, a scenario that you want to protect and to be safe and to be nice for everyone. So I think that this is one of the approach that it's not easy, but a lot of cities in Europe are involved now to trying to do that. And I think it's one of the steps in the in the right and, uh, and good direction. Thank you very much. I think uh, Amin Malouf, uh, the Lebanese French writer, has written uh, a beautiful book about this, uh, about murderous identities, Les Identités Meurtrières, where he says if we pinpoint people on one layer of their identity, be it religion or race or gender or nationality, we shouldn't be surprised if they put this in the window and think that's the only identity they have. And he says the answer is that we accept multiple layered identities uh, and I think I like the word interculturalism. Um, I saw in the chat that my dear friend uh, Mumudu Jallo has a question. So I would like him to take the mic and open the camera and ask the question himself. Yeah, hello. Um, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, perfect. Yes, we can. Thank you. Let me let me just start by thanking uh, you, Petra, and uh, Ms. Selig for this really, really amazing and uh, very important conversation on a very important topic. And also the the, the, the entire panel and the previous panel is also Malin Bjork, uh, who is a very good colleague of mine in the same party. I know she's uh, doing an amazing job at the, at the European Parliament on this issue. My question basically is, uh, is, is, is it's very easy to speak about gender equity, it's very easy to talk about the specific vulnerabilities of women, uh, migrant women, uh, but that, that is a step, a very big step, as I see it, you know, from speaking about it to actually doing something about it. And we, we've, we've had a lot of conferences that I've attended, we've had a lot of conversations that I've been a part of, and my colleague Martin Bjork has been a part of, but at the same time, whilst we talk about having gender equity, we are uh, putting in place policies, uh, pushback policies. We are externalizing borders uh, in countries where we know women uh, are facing extremely, extremely violent uh, uh, living conditions. Uh, we take Libya as an, as an example, where we have seen images and pictures, you know, where women are, are, are enslaved, women are raped, women are trafficked, and yet we have taxpayers. European tax taxpayers' money that is used to finance this process. Uh, we are externalizing borders to Libya, and we know in Denmark they they are trying now to externalize borders to to three or four different countries in Africa. Will be they'll be sending uh, uh, immigrants, especially women. So, um, what 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 is your comment on that? How do we go from words to action? How can we address the the, the double standards? We say one thing, but then we do totally different. Uh, um, is, it, is it because migrant women's rights are not equated to European women's rights? If, because if that's the case, we would never send migrant women to uh, these terrible, terrible conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jello. I always tell people here when they say we can send people back to Damascus or to Syria, I'm like, okay, are you going to take a holiday there? And then they're like, no. I'm like, why are we sending people back? But uh, 
was the question geared to one of the panelists or can I ask the panelists who wants to react to it? Because I know that not everybody can react freely on, probably not freely on this one. I'm uh, respecting the rights of civil servants in the Netherlands here. But please feel free. Gemma, can I ask you to take the floor? Yeah, I think that it's because I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm more free on that. I can say that uh, I think that absolutely, the comment is absolutely correct. We are facing in the EU, mainly the EU countries, a moral dilemma in migration policy. That is not new. It uh, has been, we have been facing this dilemma the last 20 years, but this last five years, 10 years has been more, uh, more clear, more, uh, more, more evident that we are facing a EU dilemma. For me, the problem is that people that are we're working with migration policies for a long time, we, we know that. We have uh, write that. We have send the message to that. But nobody seems to take care of that. And this is a very, uh, I don't know if I sh I'm sharing a, um, a feeling, but it's very frustrating because we are mm. talking, to, because this is not a question of only government. This is a question of EU, but it's a question of national governments that we vote, meaning that it's a question of EU citizenships. And the question is why our citizens are not really com compelled for that? Why we are not trying to, and I don't know, it's a problem of media that we don't know how to express ourselves, but sometimes it's a kind of frustration because I know that we are facing this dilemma. Migration uh, has put EU in a very, very bad uh, mirror, and we are not correcting this situation. And I think that with, this is one of the, the, when I say that we need to change the framing is also that, because I think that we, we change the framing. If people understand that we are not talking migration as a threat, but human rights to, to, that, that need to be protected, then maybe the, the, the reactions and the, the, I don't know, the commitments of the people will be different. I'm sorry, stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will go to Mandam Chilik uh, within a minute and Mr. Kiro Surema. If you want to uh, uh, react, please raise your hand, but I don't want to put you on the spot. I have one observation on the framing issue and also as a response to Mr. Jallo. When, well, not when, because it's still happening, uh, but last summer when there was this big issue with the people in Moria, more than 100 municipalities in the Netherlands said, we're very happy to take in people from Moria, let them come. But our secretary, of, uh, under deputy minister for integration, when I asked her, I said, well, this is, these municipalities represent more than 8 million people in the Netherlands. That's a constituency, isn't it? Well, she avoided this. But I think the fear of right-wing backlash has been so big all over Europe that people think that people are afraid of migrants, some politicians, and they're creating almost a bigger fear by rep repeating this in the media. This is my own personal opinion here, but I'm a politician, so I want to be political about this. Um, Madame Celek has now disappeared. Uh, is she still with us? Mr. Kiras, Rema, do you want to respond to this? You don't have to, huh? No, I, I, as you can understand, this is difficult for me to reflect yeah, on understand. because of my position, um, but the concern is well understood. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I can't see Mrs. Celik at the moment. Um, Mr. Jello, has your, uh, I know that we haven't answered your uh, question because it's almost impossible. And I think there is a common opinion in this panel that we really, really share your concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, just just uh, really quick, uh, one thing that you mentioned, and I know you are a champion in, in raising this issue, uh, Ms. Tinan, the, is, is the role of men. I think that's also something very important that you talked about here earlier on. And it would be, be important to hear what the panelists uh, have to say about that, because that's something that I think is is fundamental if we're going to be able to to uh, move forward. We can't, we can't reach gender equity. We can't be able to protect women and their rights if men of that often, uh, according to statistics, are the ones that are on the way, they're the ones that normally would, would violate the rights of women, uh, they're the ones that are represented in all these institutions that make policies that were supposed to protect women. Um, so it is important that men are part of the solution. So how do we do that in the best possible way? In Sweden, we're working really hard to do that. We have uh, groups that are called men, and, and their role is basically to try to make sure that we focus on 
bringing attention to men and making sure that men's responsibilities and their obligations in this struggle is made very clear that we as men will also be able to listen to, to, to women's realities and have an understanding but also look yeah. at it from an education point of view that from from our childhood how we teach our children gender roles uh, that leads to toxic masculinity and how we can somehow work against that so that is something that we cannot only do in the civil society but as policy makers we need to make sure we have policies and, and tools that are meant to create these conditions so that men can grow up uh, uh, away from this toxic mas masculinity that we see today in every part of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Modu. The other side of toxic masculinity, which I rather call harmful masculinity, not to make men upset with me when I use the word toxic masculinity. So I use the word harmful masculinity and the opposite of harmful masculinity is healthy masculinity. Um, Mr. Rema, did you, would you like to react? And yes, make it brief one. because I, we need to round up in like 10 minutes. No problem at all. Uh, this, this I can reflect on more easily and more freely. And it touches on what the, the question you asked before, uh, Petra, of course. How do we make men part of the solution? And uh, I do believe that part of it is education and active participation in, these, uh, in this procedure. And uh, well, like Momudu, if I, can, if I can call you by your first name, uh, said it's uh, it's very very important that we actively uh, incorporate men into this process as well, because without them, it's only a one-sided element, and we need to reflect on it from both sides. So yeah, a very valuable and very uh, yeah necessary comment. Thank you very much for this. Uh, Gemma, Gemma, do you have something to? Thank you very much, Gemma. I'm going to Gemma. Sorry that I was uh, trying to, to, to unmute. Uh, no, it's just uh, because I think it's absolutely clear that, that uh, when I say that we need to change the system in terms of understanding that gender is not only a question that we need to solve, gender inequalities meaning, it's not a question that we can solve only through migration policies. When we think about that in general, men education is absolutely part of the... Men education, no, education for everyone, because there is a lot of women that are repeating and stereotyping a lot of things. So meaning education is crucial. And in, in these terms, we, we need to understand that this uh, kind of uh, health food, uh, and uh, healthy masculinity, it's uh, really better. And it's better with a healthy also femininity, meaning that we need to create this space in which all people uh, can play the role of um, to be equal. That it's uh, so simple, but then it's so complicated when when you think about that, saying that be equal means feminism, and you see how the far right parties are in Europe now talking about feminism, that seems that it's a new radicalism of that it means being equal. I think this is part of these problems that we are facing. That we are, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because in my country now this has been a, a hot topic, and it's like I cannot understand that be equal is so revolutionary. I never thought that at my age and in the 21th century this this sentence was so revolutionary and when i say human beings are equal means in any case in any circumstance in any situation thank you very much emma and the, and i like the way that we're here with two committees from the parliamentary assembly of council of europe we're with the migration committee but also with the equality committee and in the equality committee we're working a lot on the istanbul convention obviously which is also for all of us and the Istanbul Convention has a special provision, Article 12.4, to involve men and boys. I have one last question, then I will go to Madam Celik for a few reflections from her side, and then I will go to the chairs of both of those committees who are with us here, which is also really nice to see. So I would like to ask Mrs. Uh, Munkasa to briefly make a uh, an observation or ask a question and let's see how we can respond to it briefly as well. Could you come into the call, Mrs. Moncasa? If not, then I can probably read your question in the chat. Um, Mrs. Moncasa is asking a question regarding the solidarity among women around the world. What could the EU parliamentary for the women who are facing, what could they do for the disaster or the volcano in the north of the DRC. Um, if I may answer that question myself, um, DRC is not within the realm of the Council of Europe, but obviously um, in the way we look at the policies of the European Union and the external policies of the European Union, and I also have a gender action 
platform. Uh, we will keep them uh, sharp and also, also the Istanbul Convention can be signed and ratified by countries outside of the Council of Europe. So I will leave it to that. Uh, Madam Celek, Senna, the floor is yours. If you, if you want to share some observations, thoughts, what a rich conversation we had, huh? Yes, yes, and I would like to um, thank all the participants for this pr uh, productive uh, uh, discussion and debate. Uh, I would like to ask a question, actually, uh, with respect to the um, disappearance of migrant girls and trafficking in Europe, and what, if uh, any, uh, our um, uh, speakers think of policy recommendations, which policy recommendations in this respect can be put forward to the member states. And also, we know that during the pandemic it was covered but we know that the vulnerabilities of migrant women are girls are especially heightened during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, also if they think that any specific recommendations can be put forward um, uh, in this respect thank you a big question and I will give you all 30 seconds to answer Mr. Kiros Yes, a very big question, but I'll stick to one main point. I think the main point is uh, European cooperation, because this is obviously a cross-border issue, uh, and there's only a limited amount of things that you can do within your own uh, within your own borders. So, uh, as if it pertains to uh, work by the police, for example, it's important that this is a, a European uh, cooperation, and then prevention can be held, handled by the, the, the individual individual member states. But there's a very big European component to this, and uh, it's it's necessary to have this cross-border cooperation. Thank you. Always grateful for people who uh, believe in European cooperation. Gemma? I think it's uh, just to add, uh, we need to improve cooperation in, uh, in the prevention, but we also need to think about the demand, because trafficking is not happening in a vacuum, so we need to see what is happening who is asking for that, and how we try to avoid this uh, exploitation of human beings for other human beings. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to thank all the speakers from both sessions, even though they're not all with us anymore. And I see we'll still have almost 40 participants in the call. And I know that there was uh, some audience on the Facebook side of the Parliamentary Network for Women Free of Violence. It's great that they participated with us. Um, I will now give the floor to the chair of the, equality, the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination. You know, you, when you work on equality, your name should be either Mumudu or Petra. <laughs> yes, in fact. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you all for this very diverse and rich input. And, and thank you, Petra and uh, uh, Sena, um, for the well-facilitated debate we had. Uh, of course, I, it's impossible to reflect on all the issues uh, that have been raised. And as many of you know, um, not only as chair of the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination, the question of sexual and reproductive health and rights is very close to my heart. So allow me to reflect on that uh, at the end. Um, I think it's so important that, that we all are aware that also people on the run have needs to access to sexual and reproductive health services. Women are and get pregnant also in humanitarian settings, also when they are seeking refuge. Uh, so medical assistance during pregnancy, uh, while giving birth and also postnatal care is something that really should be very high on the agenda when we think about how to um, set facilities for, for refugees. Um, some might not want to get pregnant, avoid pregnancy, uh, so they should have access to safe and fitting contraceptives, both men and women, of course, uh, alike, um, as it is important that they can decide about their reproductive um, reproductivity. And um, many, and I do not speak only about the very young ones, many also might need uh, sexuality education, which is uh, evidence-based and, and is fitting to the situation they are living in at the moment, which could also uh, change very quickly when you are on the move, of course. So I think also this, this access to education is a, a very key issue. And um, women need, and the Istanbul Convention was mentioned many times, women, of course, especially need protection from gender-based violence. That 
can be reflected in the layout and security system of accommodations, but it's also a question of awareness of the management and the security forces of, of humanitarian settings and um, the question whether there are or are not safe spaces for women, for instance, when it comes to toilets and, and, and very, very primitive mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and I think not only in humanitarian settings, also on, on the move itself, which is a, a very much more unprotected space, uh, like a humanitarian setting as such, uh, it is so important to also provide empowerment to women that they really can decide about their lives and can des make, make decisions about their sexuality, for instance, and about their um, readiness to have sex or not, for instance. Um, I, I, I know that there is a very good example um, sponsored by UNFPA that they distributed so-called digni dignity kits, um, which included basic hygiene products for women. Also, when they mm -hmm. get the period, it's often very hard for them um, to handle all the, the physical needs. Yeah, I have to be I have to be tough, but we have four more minutes. So yeah, I, I, I just need thirty more seconds. Uh, of course. Um, so I think gender mainstreaming is crucial in all these settings of life. And when you are a, a refugee or on the move, then it's especially uh, sensitive as it could save lives, in, in fact. And um, I just want to um, thank the rapporteurs and wish the two of you all the best for your work. And I think it's really key to respect a particular multiple intersectional vulnerability of refugees. And I would like to hand over to Pierre Alain. Frides now. Can I can I just make one comment? Absolutely, sexual reproductive rights will be in the report. And while I was listening to you, know, I turned 56 a few weeks ago, and I went through the menopause. And for a long time, I didn't think that would be affecting me. But I thought about all these women in the camps who are my age, and we never discuss it. But in the Netherlands, talking about a blind spot, but in the Netherlands, we have one million women in this time, in this age bracket, and it's a big taboo. And so I will go into that as well, because we're always talking about women below 40. But I think we should also talk about women above 40. That having been said, Pierre, the last words are yours. Pierre Alain, Thank Mr. You, Frides. Thank you, dear participants. At the end of this informative and, and very useful webinar, I have the very pleasant task of thanking Mrs. Petra Bayer and the member of our Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination, as well as its Secretariat for our cooperation in the organization of this web webinar. In my opinion, this symbiosis of the two topics, migration and equality, was innovative and opened new perspective of, reflecting, of reflection on the decision-making process and management of migration policy. Let me also very warmly thank all speakers whose contribution in time and knowledge was precious for us parliamentarians. I am also grateful to everybody who participated in this webinar, and I hope you will take away with you new interesting information and inspiration for your further action in promoting gender mainstreaming in migration. Finally, I would like to thank Mrs. Tinan for her initiative in organizing this webinar and for the excellent I close this webinar and I invite you to follow the work of our Committee on Migration and that of the Committee on Equality on our respective websites and Twitter. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. And can we have an applause for the Secretariat and all the people in Strasbourg who managed this fantastic webinar? Thank you, Mr. Chair of the committee. Thank you to all and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>